Okay. Yeah. So I I'm going to cut out all the intro because I think you all had a lot of uh, talks on parasites and pretty much you understand this uh, parasites uh, very well. So I'm just going to cut out all the introduction. I'll start with this slide. Actually, um, as already discussed, these are unicellular parasites. And uh, they have two endosymbiotic organelles. One is this epicoclast and mitochondria. So there are a couple of talks today on epicoclast and uh, the metabolism and their essentiality for parasite growth and survival and also ability to cause disease in animals. And not much was discussed on mitochondria, so I'm going to talk about mitochondria, slightly different, although I have some data on epicoclast as well. Um, but today... I can hear that. It will all be my record. I can talk to you later. <laughs> so what this microscope picture shows is this mitochondria is, uh, um, you know, uh, throughout the life cycle of plasmodium, you see a lot of pathological change as it grows. Uh, the mitochondria elongates and becomes reticulate. Then it goes into the mirozoids as, again, dots. You can see the green dots. And there is some morphological difference in the gametocytes as well, which you can see on the right side. Um, so uh, I work with both Plasmodium and Toxoplasma in the lab. We use it interchangeably for asking specific questions. And sometimes similar experiments in both experiments actually corroborate the results. And it's very nice sort of validation. And so it's the same thing. Here you can see Toxoplasma, the mitochondria is shown in red. It's a uh, you know, it's a big organel in the parasite and um, it has some very interesting aspects during uh, cell division. We won't go into the details. Um, this mitochondria is essential for the parasite, for sure. And a lot of work has been done in literature. So this is like a compilation of showing mitochondrial metabolism, how it is important for progression of the parasite from asexual to sexual and then completing the whole life cycle. So you can see that uh, uh, when you somehow disrupt the enzyme, either by pharmacological or genetic uh, approaches, you see that pretty much in the blood stage, which is what matters to humans, because we harbor the blood stage and that's what uh, is symptomatic in terms of malaria. Uh, really, uh, many of the knockouts and uh, disruptions don't really affect the blood stage. But the moment you go into the insect vector, <laughs> Right in the middle, you can see that the parasites cannot progress uh, throughout their lifestyle. They get stuck in the uh, muscle post. Uh, so we know that uh, this is pretty much true even for epicoplast. You know, sometimes you have certain epicoplast things which allow parasites to go uh, up to the mosquito and then they box. So nevertheless, even before all these genetic studies, uh, pharmacological studies have shown that inhibiting mitochondrial metabolism, especially the uh, respiratory chain, which is the electron transport. It's actually a good drug target. Uh, I think today, someone and we've also told a little bit about this pathway. I'm going to speak more about the metabolic function and a little bit of the inhibition using uh, uh, some very powerful inhibitors. So here, what you see is, uh, all the complexes of the electron transport chain, the interesting thing is uh, complex one is missing in the parasites. So usually in human cells, um, I think you can't see the cursor, I'm sorry. So anyway, in the human cells, you would have a complex one, but in parasites, the complex one is missing. And it's all uh, dehydrogenases, which supply the electrons to coenzyme Q, okay? The QH2 is the reduced form of coenzyme. And this reduced form of coenzyme goes to the complex 3, which is the cytochrome B. And then it is recycled as Q again. So that's the Q cycle. And this is all, you know, you have to recollect your biochemistry here. So the Q cycle is very important for moving the electrons through the electron transport. And that's important because um, without this electron, being passed along the cycle, you cannot have complex four and complex five functional. Now, <clears throat> there have been different kinds of studies showing 
both essential nature of these uh, pathways as well as sometimes generating some results which suggest these pathways are not essential for parasites to survive. Uh, so, for example, in Plasmodium, Achillevides group have shown that if you can express uh, the yeast dihydroovarotate dehydrogenase enzyme in the cytoplasm, it can bypass this entire pathway. Okay, so what is this DHODH? So if you see at the top of this figure, I have shown, I'm sorry, I'm not able to get the uh, pointer. I think it's come now. It's, it's response is very slow. Okay, anyway. So at the top, you see pyrimidine synthesis. Pyrimidine is required for DNA RNA biosynthesis. To make pyrimidines, you need uh, the precursors. And one of the steps in pyrimidine biosynthesis is conversion of dihydroorotate to orotate. Okay, that enzyme which is the dehydroorotate uh, dehydrogenase. So that is actually uh, oxidoreductase. It is coupled to the electron transport chain and it is present on the inner membrane of the uh, mitochondria. So if you block electron transport with any inhibitor, you are essentially blocking pyrimidine biosynthesis. And if there is no pyrimidine biosynthesis, you can't get DNA, RNA biosynthesis. And of course, parasites. Um, but what Akil showed was when you express this DHODH, which is a cytosolic version, then there is no problem. So the question then was is the entire electron transport chain existing only to support pyrimidine synthesis and nothing else? Okay, so what is the role of larger role of oxidative phosphorylation? Is ATP even being made in the mitochondria? So these are all questions like 10 years before these, these were all like, you know, big questions which remained unanswered. So uh, without going into further details, I'll just tell you briefly some prelim, uh, prior work which we had done was in toxoplasma, we could knock out glycolysis. And that study showed us that mitochondrial ATP synthesis is very much active. So you, it's not like, you know, this complex is not making it. So, so why is this significant? So you know this ATP synthase is a molecular motor and it has multiple subunits and it has this F1 and F0. F1 is the enzymatic part, F0 is the channel. And if you look at the parasite genome, you can't identify the genes encoding all these subunits. Okay, so whatever is shown on the right side here, these were all missing in the parasite genome. So uh, when you do a phylogeny, you will see that uh, Wherever you see white box, it's all missing subunits. You can see that the entire phylum of epicomplexa is missing all this uh, F0 subunits. So we did some uh, work on this. We uh, actually made some uh, modified uh, transgenic parasites, which are expressing the fluorescent ATP synthase complex. And we showed that it is functional despite this modification. We purified this complex from uh, blue native gels. We did some aspect work. We also did some immunoprecipitation, pulled out all this protein, and we could identify all the subunits. And when we identify the subunits from uh, toxoplasma, if you go to all the other parasites, so on the right side, you can see all the different uh, clades of epicomplex and parasites. So all of these proteins are conserved across the epicomplex and phylum. So this was nice. So basically, we now have a lot of evidence that the OXFOS is very important. It's not just for pyrimidine biosynthesis, but ATP synthesis and possibly other functions as well. So the next question is, what about uh, inhibiting this uh, pathways for antiparasitic development? So I already told you that apart from this, you know, fundamental studies, there is already a drug which exists, which uh, can target this uh, um, oxfos and kill the parasite. So it's called atoquan. It's very potent antimalarial compound. That's the structure of the molecule. And it's very powerful because it's single digit nanomolar uh, EC50 values. And it targets the cytochrome B protein of uh, the complex three of the electron transport chain. Okay. So it's a very old drug and it has been uh, approved for clinical use from the late 90s, uh, from mid 90s, but as early as 2000 itself or even a little earlier than that, resistance was reported from clinical samples. And uh, 
interestingly, this molecule, because it gets parasites get easily resistant to this molecule, although it's very powerful. So then people found out that if you partner this drug with this other molecule called proguanin, you get uh, you get a combination which is even more powerful. The EC50 valley goes to picomonas. So people thought that using a combination <coughs> means you can avoid resistance as well. But unfortunately, even for the combination, now we have reported resistance from clinical samples. Um, here, this graph, particularly this uh, bottom right, you can see this graph how when you combine atoquan with proguanin, there is a thousand fold uh, drop in, uh, you know, you say uh, 100, 100 fold to 200 fold drop, not thousand fold. Um, but like I told you, resistance is there. And these are all the different mutations in cytochrome B, which people have mapped and how these mutations actually affect uh, you know, drug efficacy in the parasite. So we know that we have a good target. Uh, we have a good molecule as well, but unfortunately there is resistance. So the obvious question is, can we actually make new molecules targeting the same um, you know, target and affecting this mitochondrial oxfos? So, uh, we try to design some molecules. Actually, if you go back and if you see this atopon, which is very powerful, you see that uh, quinone ring with uh, oxygens, uh, that, are, that is a naphthoquinone ring. It's very common natural product, okay? Many natural products actually have this naphthoquinone ring, okay? And so one of the things we looked at is uh, uh, this, uh, there is this uh, Mehendi plant, it has this, this orange color uh, pigment, which is there. It's actually an aphthoquinone. So one of my collaborators, actually, they developed modified uh, naphthoquinones from uh, this plant extracts. And it's all synthetic compounds we made, inspired by the natural backbone from this plant. And the, uh, the structure is very similar to Atokwan, except uh, you have a long hydrophobic tail attached to this. I can't reveal the structure because we are still in the process of IP protection and things like that. Uh, so there is a very long hydrophobic tail attached and that is very useful. I'll tell you why it's very useful because if you remember carefully, uh, in the beginning I showed you that this uh, ubiquinone is there, which is particip participating in the Q cycle <coughs> electrons. So if you look at the structure of ubiquinone, it's actually a naphthoquinone structure. And this ubiquinone binds to cytochrome B. And this ubiquinone binding pocket is where atoquan also goes and binds and it inhibits the protein. Uh, but the interesting thing is ubiquinone is not a free molecule which is floating in the cytoplasm or anything. It's actually, it's having an isoprene tail. Um, and so it is anchored into the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Okay, so that is how ubiquinone is. So you can imagine that the inner membrane of the mitochondria is there and the ubiquinone is anchored like this and it is moving on the membrane carrying electrons to cytochrome B. But atoquan is a molecule that is floating around. It is not associated with the membranes. Okay, so that's a big difference in the way the molecules access the target. So the inhibitor we made actually has a lipid tail and although we don't have any evidence for this, any direct evidence, we believe that it could get anchored on the membrane and act similar to ubiquinone. Okay. So uh, we did some anti-malarial screens with this uh, loss zone derivatives. These are the molecules made from uh, the uh, natural product. And we found some molecules which are having some decent inhibitory a potential like you know half a micromolar kind of range 400 nanomolar 300 nanomolar such the question is once you have inhibitors targeting cytochrome b how can you show that that is the mechanism because just identifying inhibitor is not the end of the story so we want want to study mechanism so we developed a mass spec assay in the presence of inhibitor you can see that <coughs> if you see this graph gap uh, there is control and atoquan treated uh, parasites. In only in atoquan treated parasites, you can see accumulation of dihydroboretate. In control, you don't see the accumulation. That is because you see the metabolic pathway. If you block cytochrome B, 
dihydroboratite cannot get converted into orotate. And then you'll get a block dihydroboratite to accumulate and you can check it by mass spec. So using this methodology, we could confirm that uh, all of our molecules, the natural product inspired uh, inhibitors, all of them are blocking uh, and, uh, the enzyme and then dihydroboratite. Sorry? Okay, it's coming up. <coughs> so all of these molecules are blocking and we can see dihydroboratite is increasing. So mechanistically, we can show that. And this is uh, staining for mitochondrial potential using JC1. You can see that Atoquan here ha has loss of staining. And our natural product uh, molecule is also having the same sort of effect. So now the question is, we also wanted to see whether resistance can arise against this molecule. Okay. So we, we did this in vitro uh, treatment and we tried to make mutant parasites in culture which are resistant to this molecule. And we could generate some things which are almost thousand fold resistant. Um, the EC50 from all the way from four nanomolar, it uh, went up to 20 nanomolar. Uh, tw sorry, 20 micromolar. Uh, although they were resistant to autoquan, the parasites uh, showed similar uh, uh, sensitivity to other drugs like pyrimethamine, artemisinin, and chloroquine, such as uh, between wild type and the mutant, there was not much of a difference. So we did the whole genome sequencing of this uh, mutants. We identify all the mutations. And then we found very, very interestingly, there was no mutation in cytochrome B. Because I've been telling you all along that cytochrome B is the target and mutations in cytochrome B cause resistance. When we did this in vitro assay, we never found any cytochrome B mutations, but we found mutations in uh, dihydroboratate dehydrogenase. And exactly around the time we found this uh, mutation, there was also a paper published uh, which said that uh, there are clinical isolates now which show dihydroboratate dehydrogenase mutation and atoquan resistance. Okay, and uh, very, very interestingly, whatever uh, mutants we generated in the lab, they had mutation A in the exact same position, which is 276, a cysteine is converted to tyrosine. But in the clinical isolate, the same cysteine is converted into a filling alanine. So, okay, basically the same position is getting mutated. So, this is very interesting. So, the question is, why would mutation in dihydroboratate uh, dehydrogenase cause resistance to atoquan? because atoquan is actually targeting uh, cytochrome B. So this mechanism is still not known. Nobody knows this. We are doing some experiments to figure it out, uh, but that's, that's where we are right now. So we have this mutation. So the question now is, okay, these mutants give resistance to atoquan. What about resistance to the molecules we made, which are actually also targeting cytochrome B? So it was very interesting when we did this work, we could see that the EC50 is the same, whether it is the wild type parasite or the mutant parasite. So we got the same EC50 values. And uh, if you see this uh, JC1 staining, whenever there is atoquan resistance, <laughs> you can see that there is red color, which means the mitochondrial potential is not inhibited by atoquan. But the bottom panel shows that the mitochondrial potential is disappearing, which is uh, the molecule which we made looks to be active even against this uh, mutant parasites. Now, the concern which I have is that we don't have a cytochrome B mutant. We are trying desperate, desperately to make a mutant in the lab. The problem with making cytochrome B mutants is you can't do any genetic modification with CRISPR or anything because this is mitochondrially encoded gene. So we can't manipulate the mitochondria. At least so far, there is no example. So we have to try to evolve these mutants in the lab, and that's what we are trying to do now. Once we get the mutants, we'll know whether the molecule which we have is actually uh, effective against the cytochrome B mutants as well. So that will be very important to show. So this is all lab-based work, but there is a lot of uh, resistance on the field as well. So we thought, how can we correlate what we are doing in the lab to what's going on in the field as well? Uh, 
So if you think about it, malaria is a human parasite, but there are a lot of other epicomplex and parasites which affect animals as well. So today I'm not going to tell you anything about some of the clinical work we are doing in malaria because it's still ongoing and we don't have the final data yet. But I can tell you something about some other parasites which are infecting uh, uh, bovine species. So there is this parasite called thyleria, which is also epicomplexa. And it has the same type of mitochondria, it has the same type of epicoplast. The biology is a little different, but metabolically, these organelles are very similar. So this is the prevalence of thyleriosis. And you won't believe 50% of animals in India or even more, probably nobody has the real surveillance data. We are doing some things now to address this. Very highly prevalent. It is transmitted by the stick. And it's in many parts of the world, especially tropical countries. And this is the life cycle. I did not show you malaria life cycle, but I'm showing you this life cycle. <laughs> this goes between bovine species and the tick. And it's the same thing, sexual stages in the tick versus asexual stages in the bovine species. The interesting thing is, um, these are um, grouped under this clade called pyroplasmas. And uh, the interesting difference is, this thyleria parasite, it can infect red cells as well as lymphocytes. When it infects lymphocytes, it completely transforms the lymphocyte and then it takes over the lymphocyte machinery. It doesn't uh, kill the lymphocyte. It basically integrates with the lymphocyte. And then um, the mechanism how parasites divide is they make the lymphocytes divide. When the lymphocytes divide, the parasites also divide. Um, and whenever they, just like how plasmodium form gametocytes, there are very few parasites which come out of these lymphocytes. They infect the RBCs, that is the pyroplasma stage. And the RBC infected stages are then transmitting through the tick. So that's, that's the difference here. The interesting thing is, uh, at the bottom I have highlighted in yellow, that is the drug, Goproquan, which is the only drug available to treat this uh, disease. Okay. And atoquan and buproquan are structural analogs. They same exact same mechanism. So whatever I told you earlier about the resistance mechanism, everything is applicable to buproquan as well. And we know that there is a lot of treatment failure in the in the field. Like when animals are infected and buproquan is administered, it doesn't always clear the parasite. And unfortunately, at least in India, there is nothing being done. There is no surveillance. Nobody knows what is the prevalence of mutations which can cause resistance to buproquan. So because we are doing all the basic studies on this, applying all of our knowledge on this, we try to do some field work as well. And this is all similar stuff here. So we can skip this thing. So I can tell you, so this is what you're seeing at the top is the entire mitochondrial genome. And there are only three genes encoded by the mitochondria. One of it is the cytochrome B, which I have again expanded in the middle. And all the red stars are the reported mutations in cytochrome B, which can cause resistance to uh, buproquan as well as atopoan. Okay, very similar proteins. Uh, they are highly, you know, sequence-wise conserved. And uh, this is the structure and all that. And all those uh, blue boxes you see, those are the ubiquinone binding sites which is where all the mutations are, which cause resistance. So when we looked at our uh, field samples, um, I'm sorry, I don't have a better slide for this. This is not the best way to show the data, but uh, there are little boxes and there are numbers at the top and uh, bottom rows. <clears throat> the bottom row is the number of animals which show the mutation. And the top row is the amino acid position that shows the mutation. And then you can see in between that position 146, which is right in the Q01 uh, binding pocket. And then uh, there is another 203 position, which is in the Q1 binding pocket. So these are two positions which are showing very high prevalence of mutation. And these mutations are already reported from Africa and Middle Eastern countries as resulting in clinical uh, treatment failure for thaliriosis. 
So basically, we have the genotype data from uh, sequencing 100 to 200 animal uh, samples collected from animals. Uh, these are basically dairy cows. But right now, we we have to now, the next step is to correlate this genotype with actual clinical you know, treatment failure. So we are initiating this study now. So we are actually collecting samples from animals which are under buprocon treatment. We will follow them and see whether they are responding to the treatment or not. And then we'll be sampling multiple times the same animal to, to see what is happening. And the interesting thing is you can see that in many of these uh, boxes at the bottom, uh, you will see four animals. So we found four animals which were all owned by the same farmer, which all four were infected with thyleria. And they had multiple mutations across the mitochondrial genome, which we have never seen before. So whether it is a new species of thyleria, which, which is not mapping to our reference, so we are picking it up mutations, or this is just indeed, you know, these many mutations uh, present across the uh, cytochrome B and other genes in the mitochondria. We don't know. We are sequencing the genome. We'll soon know what's happening with these parasites. Uh, the other interesting thing is, if indeed we prove that buprocon resistance is there and treatment failure is very high because of these mutations, what do we do about it? Is there an alternate? This is where the drug which I showed, uh, you know, it had all this anti-malarial efficacy against atocon resistant malaria parasites. We can actually try it against buprocon resistant thyleria parasites as well. And if not a uh, human drug for treating malaria, at least we can make a drug which is able to treat some animal disease. So some kind of a translation we can do there. So this is pretty much what I have to say today. Then I will close by acknowledging, uh, of course, my students from NCL, but my first acknowledgement is for my collaborators from BIOF with whom I do all the field work. Uh, without them, I wouldn't be able to do that. And of course, some other collaborators who, and then funding agencies who helped us do this work. Thank you all, and I'll take questions. Right. Question. Uh, oh, well. uh, Betaquin also acts on ATP synthase. Betaquin, it acts on ATP synthase, but on the C subunit, the C which forms the... multiple mechanism now. There is a publication recently. Yeah, when it was discovered, the actual... Uh, even there is a crystal structure binding to the C subunit of ATP synthase. Uh, the binding, because the the C the C ring of ATP synthase, the number of subunits that make the ring can vary. Yes. So the bacterial ATP synthase has, I, if I am right, um, I don't know the exact number, but a different number of C subunits that make up the ring. I'm not sure betaquilin will have the same binding efficacy with uh, uh, plasmodium ATP synthase or toxoplasma ATP. They're, they're the same, basically identical proteins. So I'm not sure it will work, but uh, I think it's something which can be. Actually, I uh, when Dr. Kaul was there in Imtech, once I met him and we were talking, he said, why don't you try but Same thing. He said, you should try betaquilin for uh, malaria thing. But somehow, you know, we could not do that. Uh, no, but how different is the structure with this uh, structure of uh, atoquin or your, uh, have you tried to look into that? Atoquin and, and the molecules we are. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the, uh, like I said, I can't reveal the structure now, but the naphthoquinone ring is identical. It's only the side chain which differs. So I can... So that is atoquan. The naphthokinone ring with oxygen and hydroxy, that is identical. The side chain is a little different. And from the naphthokinone, one of the positions, we have a hydrophobic tail. So we are doing some membrane uh, simulation studies. And also we are trying to do some liposomal studies to see whether uh, this uh, molecule is actually getting inserted into the membrane. I have a naive question about the layer. So none of the uh, antibiotic-like or others such as doxycycline, clindamycin, and things like that are working against it? 
Just thinking because you mentioned about the presence of the plastic there. Yes, yes. I think it will work, but the problem there is switching uh, all prokaryotes. These are there. all antibacterial. Yes, and I was thinking about that too, but there is a big problem because already antibiotic over usage is there in dairy industry because there is antibiotics in food and antibiotics because there are other uh, other uh, diseases like mastitis, which is a bacterial disease, and then already antibacterial efficacy is very low. There, AMR is a big uh, issue with mastitis. I don't think any regulator will give approval for using antibacterial compounds to kill. Uh, Especially, yeah, the only be. antibacterial that is used for ant uh, for protozoan is this clindamycin, which is used for toxoplasma. Yes, indeed. Yeah, uh, that is phosphidomycin a, as well. I guess it's not uh, uh, very poor. Feasible. Yeah. It's yes, yeah, bad. Um, I was thinking about something that's that's like. Uh, very AP complex, a specific that, that, that I don't know how much I've been tried actually. I, I'm very naive uh, regarding uh, the area. So I can show you some data we have with again with the MMB box. We yeah. did a oh, yeah, rem- epicoplast yeah. screen. Yes. And so we have identified uh, some floxacin like molecules as well as other molecules which show epicoplast segregation defect and mm-hmm. delayed death and all. So we are doing some mechanistic studies on some of these molecules. We have the mutants, we are sequenced. We How are, about triclosan and things like that? Triclosan is very bad. Right? Yeah, I know. Well, I was, I know. Huh? <laughs> <Don't laugh. laughs> it's just about the fact that can we think about like plant metabolism or things like that that could be like away from the prokary- anti prokaryotic pathways? And see, I think with animals, one of the big problems is you know, naturally animals eat. Uh, uh, you know, plants which are not processed, right? They, right. they just probably the have the, uh, they have a lot of, in. I think they get a lot of medicine from the plants they eat, but in our dairy now everything is processed food. And so it's all dried and processed food. And that itself, the nutrient value is very low. Mm-hmm. So they're eating a lot, mm-hmm. but they're getting very low nutrition. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a lot of other reasons why they are heavily dependent on antibiotic. Okay. Otherwise, I don't think they, I think uh, especially breeds in India, indigenous cows, they are supposed to be resistant to these things. But now there is all these cross breeds and imported animals. And so this has become a big problem again. Yeah. That's it. Um, yeah, Danny. Yes. So this LW16, uh, you made drug resistance parasite for this. No, no, we made resistance against Atopon. Atopon, okay. And then we saw that it is still sensitive to LW16. Okay. The other question is although the, mechanistically we think both are same because we did the mass spec and then the mass spec signature is identical for both. Uh, I mean, just a general question. This proganil and Atopon they show extensive synergistic effect. Yes. Uh, do you know why? Yeah, I wish I knew why. <laughs> because progonil alone, I don't have this data here, or maybe I have. It is in micromolar. Yes, it is 20 micromolar. Yes. Uh, progonil alone, this you can see that here. Um, the top graph, you see, it is 20 or above, like not 26 micromolar in the experiment. 15. But if you combine it with, uh, and we have done titrations, uh, fixing progonil and titrating atoquan, or fixing atoquan, titrating progonil. So from all these studies, we know that the combination reduces uh, both. So atoquan can reduce progonil's EC50. So in the presence of atoquan, progonil EC50 from 26 micromolar goes to less than one micromolar. But the other way is more powerful. They are on the same pathway, but it is shown that they are not on the same pathway. <laughs> the interesting thing, another interesting thing is LW16 doesn't show any synergy. LW16. It doesn't show the synergy. That is very interesting. Yeah, that's why we think, although it is something to do with how the drug is presented to the target, because um, Again, I'm just making the point, LW16 may be anchored on the membrane Mm -hmm. and it may be accumulating on the inner membrane and getting access to cytochrome B rather than atopon, which is floating around. And how it has a synergy with proguanil, but LW16 doesn't have is still, you know, not sure. 
So we tried making mutants to progonyl as well. Mm -hmm. So when Jeremy came, he was uh, suggesting to me, maybe progonyl, you know, it is a late acting inhibitor. So you see it's EC50 at 96 hours. It is more powerful. It's it's slow acting. So, so we, we are doing those. We are not, we still don't have the results, but we are doing those experiments. Long live India and France friendship.